Okay, guys, this is <laughs> really fun. Uh, off Festival is at the moment happening in Barcelona, and here are some really, really interesting people coming to the city. And I was riding with Talia Cotton from New York, and she, uh, yeah, she agreed to have an interview. She will come in one hour to my office here. So I've been uh, just making some tests with Eva, and yeah, we will just build a little studio setup kind of thing to, yeah, record this conversation, and I'm excited. Let's see how that goes. One last check, is the recording running? Um, that looks great, amazing. Okay, this recording is also running. Amazing. <laughs> Talia, welcome to Barcelona. Thanks, Tim. Amazing, that's so cool. I was looking forward for this for a long time, two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we just uh, had a quick chat and you said yeah. you are around, yeah. close Excellent. by. Yeah, amazing. How great can that be, right? Yeah. So nice. Great timing. Thanks so much for, for bringing me out here. Thank you for joining here. We are in Glass House right now, which is my co-working. Um, Beautiful space. I was. This is a super improvised setup, by the way, like I told you about that, but there's my computer. Yep. Hello, guys. Hi. You are my computer. I have this <laughs> phone. I don't know if I should put, put this phone here, maybe. It's very resourceful. Let's just assume it's going to work. It looks like the sound bars are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, check, check, check. Hello. Great. I don't want to scream, but yeah, I think it's going to work. Maybe I put it a little bit further to me. Great. No, I don't do that because the table is going to break. <laughs> anyway, great. Great. When did you land? I got here just a few hours ago. Wow. I took a little nap. I okay. took a few meetings and then I came out here because you texted me. A few meetings before this meeting. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on for you, right? Always, but I love uh, it. That's cool. Yeah. You founded a studio. I did. Uh, How long? A uh, little when? over a year ago. We had our first birthday last month. So wow. we're, we're a little baby right now and it's going great. We're big, we're big baby. Amazing, that's yeah. so cool. And you have how many people working there now? We've got a, a two, two designer coders who love what they do, which is Amazing. the best part of my job. So you are now a CEO? <laughs> Uh, let's call it executive creative director. I feel mm. I'll be comfortable saying that when I have maybe multiple things going yeah, on, yeah. then I'll feel more like a. Well, also, how, how do you say it in, in in English? Like the jack of all trades. That's how I am as well. Like there you go. doing everything yourself. Yeah. Sometimes I source a lot of work out as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. But I love your work since a long time already. Like you've Thank been you. at Pentagram before already, right? Yeah, I did uh, three years at Pentagram. Ah, uh, cool. And then I. Did my own thing. Cool. Nice. How did they react when you said you leave? <laughs> oh, oh, that's a good question. Um, they they were diplomatic. I think a lot of them saw it coming. Um, I, I think it was no surprise. Uh, the year before I left, I had already been I've do, been doing so many things outside of Pentagram. I was mm. giving talks everywhere, doing external projects that were sometimes getting more publicity than the projects I was doing at Pentagram. Um, there was a little internal stuff I had asked for. We, we were talking about what that would mean for my role at Pentagram. Mm. And it just made sense because there wasn't really the right role carved out for someone like me, the designer, coder, the boss, the leader, that kind of thing. Ah, okay. Okay, I have to catch up on this because this is very interesting. It's something that uh, I observe a lot in yeah. the industry right now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And then you now feel more like liberated? Is it like something you can do your own thing? And Yes and no. Um, mm. Yes, definitely I can do my own thing. At Pentagram, I was already doing my own thing. Um, cool. I was in a very special position there where um, I was on two teams. Oftentimes I didn't have to run my work by Michael Bayreid or Georgia Lupi before I saw it to the uh, showed it to the client. Mm -hmm. um, it was very I was very client facing. I was leading pretty much every project I was on, so I still had the the, the flexibility there and I had the leadership there, the autonomy there. But I think that still I liked the idea of creating a space where I could focus almost 100 percent of my attention on this new thing of like designing using code as like the primary medium that's and amazing. so far it's been great so far it's been exactly what I've, I've wanted that's amazing i have three questions in mind i have to decide which one i ask next um <laughs> so maybe let's take a talk quickly about this gap between technology and design yeah. which is like uh like it's existing everywhere that's yeah. my feeling right yeah. now so how did you pitch ideas that are built based on code to a branding project yeah and and the gap is not not to abort your question for a second the gap is getting smaller um mm, it's true. it's a lot smaller now than it was 
one year ago and a lot smaller than it was five years ago when I first started out there was no such thing as a designer who coded Mm -hmm. and now everyone who's graduating college knows how to code so um, so that gap is getting smaller but there's still kind of like um, there's a gap in the education of the senior designers and the creative directors because they didn't have the coding Um, Mm -hmm. so that's there's sort of like that figure out Um, what was your question again um, Actually, you are already answered. No, yeah. when you, you're done. I was, asking, I was asking, asking you how you uh, pitched an idea That's right. that was based on code, yeah. with, let's say, an identity project or something. Yeah. It, it all comes down to don't use the C word. Don't say, Aye. oh, and by the way, this is code, right? Um, it's like saying, coding is, at the end of the day, it's just the, the design medium. It's just the way that you make what you're making. It's like saying, when you're pitching to a client, it's like saying, oh, and this next direction is made with Figma. Like, no one cares, or like, huh. right? Um, you have to sell the idea, say, this is, this is what's so great about it, and this is why this, is, this represents your mission, or this is how it's gonna speak to your audiences. Okay. And then at the very end, they say, that's great, it looks like it'll be hard to make, how do you do it? And then the snap is like, oh, by the way, we already have this generator tool that like we use to make this presentation for you, so it's done. It's coded. And that sort of like gets people excited about it and, and ease up at the at the idea that something is in this sort of like mysterious medium that they don't know about. That's interesting, but does it mean like you have to put a lot of effort into the project before you create the presentation? Like compared yeah. to compared to using like a GUI tool like Figma or something? Yeah. Um, a- We do some presentations where we show eight different concepts and every single one of those concepts is a different coded direction. And that sounds really daunting. That sounds really crazy. Like that sounds like, you know, it it takes two weeks to put together a presentation. You have to do eight different coding things. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think luckily, I think that's where that gap is getting a little bit closed up now is that I'm pushing my team to be that fast at coding. Mm. And, it's it's scrappy it's a little bit kind of like pushing things but it's i think if the concept is good the code will come right mm. you can you can fill the gaps in how you talk about it but it. um yeah it's you you do a lot of coding that makes sense so i have a, I have a course in my curriculum which is called sketching strategies yeah. which is all about actually it has nothing to do with coding but how to organize your files, how to put your ideas to, mm. to your, let's say, hard drive, mm-hmm. how to name them, mm-hmm. how to create derivatives of an idea and like have a very fluid process because that sometimes I see some students just working on one sketch yeah. all the time, changing things, and then they forget like, oh, wait, I didn't save the other stage, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? So I can imagine that when you work with your team on coded ideas, like you have a big repository of things you already did, right? Yeah, Mm. Um, it always starts out with no code. It starts out with we're all around a table and Mm -hmm. we're just like any design prompt, you brainstorm ideas just using words like, okay, how do we represent this abstract idea using visual concepts, but then also using coded concepts like interactivity and generativity. Um, And then we have a ridiculous repository with a million different folders. And we usually do one branch for some reason because it's nice to just have everyone's work in one place. but yeah, we end up having like a single like uh, default unstyled HTML landing page with like links out to like like eight different directions and like s- s- ten different iterations on one direction just mm. to see it sort of like moving along. Oh, that's great! Um, I love that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's so cool. It's a lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. We have, and then we have, um, of course, we have the Slack channel with all of our coding mistakes. So we, mm. it's really lighthearted and fun. That means like you post happy little accidents to mm-hmm. it and say, hey, look at this, yeah. I completely crash the tools. Yeah. That's amazing, yeah. I love that. That's yeah. super, super cool. It's super fun. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Um, I had a question in mind, I just forgot it. My goodness. It was a good question. I'm sure it I was. hate forgetting good questions. You I know? agree, like, it'll, it'll, it'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah, true. So that's great. I mean, I have the feeling that the whole thing gets way more popular, like things get really fast right now. I, yeah. My personal thesis is that this has a lot to do with AI. Like mm-hmm. people started, because before this AI shock, that's mm-hmm. how I call it, like mm-hmm. the thing that happened in 2022, mm-hmm. when people started to you know, see that there's a command line, like an yeah. like interface where you can prompt things, right? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, this was mind blowing for many people. I, I mean, we as coders knew some of the stuff probably before I did. I was um, mm -hmm. on some blogs yeah, yeah. checking out that. But yeah, so, um, but I see that the students even adapt the aesthetics. It was unimaginable years before, yeah. you know, like they adapt like this code. I love that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important, mm -hmm. right? How do you mm -hmm. perceive that? For the, the coded aesthetic yeah, using exactly. AI? No, uh, coded aesthetics in general in graphic mm -hmm. design. Well, um, I actually, I think I, I teach against that. And it's not to say that I, I am inherently against it. It's just the, the methodology I use is um, with every single design tool out there, you're going to gravitate more towards what is easy. What is easy in code is, say, something like a for loop. You do something a hundred times, and that's like, it's an easy thing to do. Got it. And one of the things that I constantly push my students to look past is don't do something just because it's easy with code. Come up with a really smart idea, and sometimes it's just one line of code that's a smart line of code. Mm -hmm. And then that's where people look at it, and they're like, oh, wow, that's like, that, that makes sense to me. It's not just like, Great. that looks cool or that looks coded. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I see what that means. That's, that's my own personal philosophy on coding with design. And I see that there's a whole other world of like just exploring what that coded aesthetic is and how that's also pushing, pushing the boundary of design. Mm -hmm. um, and I just look at it a little differently. I love that. I think that's something that also gets clear in your work from my point of view. Like when I see, I was just surfing your website and your Instagram channel, I see that you are pretty much having the simplicity in, in these things, right? And uh, let's say complexity is easy with code, mm -hmm. but simplicity is difficult, right? That's right. That's, uh, that's, that's right. really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's great. How do the students react to your statement that they have to use code to create graphic design? Um, they are petrified. They, um, I, I think what every coding student has in common is that they all think they're the worst in the class. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what I do on the first day of every class, of, the, of my advanced class, is I give them a pop quiz and then oh, I... Sorry, a what? A, a pop quiz. What is, a, what is a pop quiz? A quiz is an unexpected quiz that they don't have time to study for, where I give them like a few different coding prompts just to see where they are. And then I make them do a challenge where they all um, they all write five lines of code in a group and then they switch and then they go to someone else's computer and then they, Ooh. and it throws them off. And wow. at the very end of the class, I say, how many of you feel extremely intimidated right now? Or I say, I say, how many of you um, are impressed by your classmates today? And they all raise their hand. And then I say, how many of you are extremely intimidated? And they all raise their hand. <laughs> and I say, well, that doesn't add up. You can't be impressed by everyone around you and also be intimidated because that math doesn't math. You That's like smart. every. So, so a lot of it is just like encouraging them a little bit more, and it's an ego boost. Um, um, I like to, I like to let them lean into what they want to do, what their art direction is, and how they want to do it with code. I'm there almost as like a boost to to help them strategize and make it happen. Mm -hmm. But a little bit, it's I'm I'm trying to make them kind of come up with the concepts themselves. That's not great. So you you ask them to create own concepts. What what kind of concept could that be like? A Identity or yeah, it, in my advanced class, it's um. Yeah, go ahead. Some water. Do you need water? I do. I was gonna. I think this is fine. Okay, okay. Thank you. No worries. Mm. Maybe I take a quick look at the curve here. Yeah. Session two. Yeah. Talia and Tim on the sofa at Glasshouse. Amazing. Uh, okay, so um, we were talking about teaching. Yeah. What do you enjoy more, teaching or working for clients, or working on our project, own projects? I think it depends on the day. Um, in general, I love the work that we do. I love, I love the agency life. I love working on client work. I'm sort of like weird in that regard. I think. Sorry? I think I think most designers like um, don't like clients. I I love. Hmm. Um, I, I think the, the people skills is half of the job and Absolutely. understanding what they need, even if they can't articulate it. Some people are really hard to do that. So I love that side of things. Um, 
yeah, I don't know which one I like. I think I think I like working more, <laughs> but don't tell my students that. <laughs> but are, I, I, but I love life but I love the... teaching. I love teaching. So it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, I, I wouldn't give it up for the world. I would never quit. I have to say, like when I'm I'm in the in Elisaba, for example, I'm teaching there. Sometimes I feel like the first hour is okay. The mm -hmm. second hour is a disaster. Like mm -hmm. it becomes a disaster. I feel very exhausted. Oh my god. Do you feel like the same? No, never. Because. <laughs> My perception is that the class is full of different personalities yeah. with different well, that's teaching. Yeah, with different uh, skill levels. Yeah. And when I explain for example especially life coding stuff, yeah. uh, it's very difficult for me to find the common ground, right? Yeah. Like to find out okay, how far can I get? Yeah. And who's who are those people that I lose right now? Yeah. And sometimes I feel like, okay, I wrote this line of code, maybe a for yeah. loop, and I see, okay, I lost Sophia, yeah. I lost Michael, yeah. you know, at that point. Yeah. That's something I, I have a, I feel like I have a radar for yeah. th this kind of, yeah. Yeah, it, kind of it's thing. good to have that radar. Do you, do you find that, do you feel that you, you te sometimes, you tend to teach too easy or do you tend to teach too hard? Too, too easy, I guess. I'm the opposite. Uh, yeah. You are American. That's different. I am American. I don't know if it's because I'm American, though. I don't know. Wait, well, well. I know a lot of teachers in America who teach easy. I, I have a, a an ongoing argument with an old teacher of mine, who um, who underestimates his students, and I tend But to overestimate them. There's a big, you know. I think this is an interesting topic because I guess there is a difference between the students in the U.S. and in uh, in Europe. Okay. Because in the U.S. Well, it doesn't really apply to Elisaba, uh, maybe, but in Germany, I've been teaching yeah. in many different universities there. And um, my feeling is, first of all, they're not, they are not sensibilized for the power of coding anyway. Mm -hmm. For them, coding is like something super weird. Mm -hmm. And I try to push them to mm -hmm. make them, you know, aware of the culture, mm -hmm. aware of the things that are really interesting about that, like things they can learn beyond writing mm -hmm. code into a code editor. This is something I find super important. But my feeling is uh, it changed a lot in the last years, but how I started to teach was like, okay, there's this alien guy who wants us to do something ridiculous, right? We have to write code, <laughs> which is, you know, that's how I felt a little bit. Yeah. And I tried to make it as cool as possible, like yeah. make programming cool again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which is a weird uh, thing to say these, to these days. but. Yeah, but um, I don't know. It's difficult. Yeah. 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 It's interesting the American versus European student thing. Um, I've given a few workshops for European students and given a few talks, but I guess I don't know enough of that dichotomy. Probably the places where you've been are not represented for the for the mass of different universities. So I've been to teaching at like bigger ones, but also smaller ones, yeah. and the smaller ones have the problems that they are very regionally uh, organized. That yeah. means they have to actually cover lots of things mm -hmm. with just a few teachers. Mm -hmm. And they're not really specialized or don't have a strong mm -hmm. profile, mm -hmm. I guess. Right. I find that I'm just replaying all of the different universities I've been to and, and taught at roughly. And I think what it comes down to really is getting them excited about seeing what the product can be mm -hmm. in something that they recognize. Mm -hmm. I think it it helps if if it's just like an ice and this this continues the theme that we that we keep coming back to is that if it's just like an isolated cool thing in coding a for loop or like a cool just something that looks cool it's not as effective as you can make this logo or you can make this poster or mm -hmm. you can make this graphic and apply it in a context that the design students are like, oh, this is something that I'm working on in my other class and this is a way to make it a little bit more anchored. So again, it always comes down to what are those projects and how do you, how do you encourage that coding is just the tool to get there and it's just a different kind of a tool. To be honest, you make me really think about my, uh, the outlines of my <laughs> upcoming classes because I'm, uh, maybe my students know that, yeah. but um, I always have been emphasizing the liberty um, of more playing around like yeah. experimenting with the things without having a very clear concept because they already do that in all yeah. their classes yeah. right so um, but what you tell me like it sounds really interesting I'm thinking I'm in doubt with my 
with my ideas right now with it with that I, kind of I think they need a little bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. I know at, at Parsons where I teach, I have another colleague who teaches another class and um, do, you, do you know John Preventure? Do you know his work? I love his work. Yeah. So yeah. he's very, he, we're very close. We worked together a while. Ah, amazing. And he and I are polar opposites ah. in our coding philosophy and the outputs. And his aesthetic looks very different from my aesthetic, right? Absolutely. Um, and the way that he teaches, because we have a lot of the same students, is a little bit more like, just see what comes. Lean into this, this <laughs> thing and just, you know, lean into it, right? And I think it's good for the students to have both perspectives. It's like the good cop, bad cop thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Who's the bad cop, me? <laughs> In this case, I would say it's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you need a good bad cop. Um, yeah. I want to I wanna tell you, though, um, just to plant ideas on how that advanced class goes, because it ends up being really, um, really effective. On the first day of class, we ask, this is, they've all, they already know the basics of coding. Mm -hmm. On the first day of class, we do the whole spiel of, um, well, why do we code? Of course, you have to do that on day one. That's great. Always. And they were like, oh, the gap in the design world, and maybe you get a higher salary. And some of them are like, interactivity? Um, and then we, we, I really push them. And then what it comes down to is, there's sort of like two buckets of why designers should code. Three buckets of why designers should code. The first bucket is career. And that's stupid. We don't care about that in, in the class for the sake of the class. Like higher pay or whatever, or the, to close that gap. We push that one aside. Mm -hmm. The second bucket is that coding can do things in design, uh, can create new possibilities in design in form and in function. That's where we talk about coding can be interactive. Coding mm -hmm. can be automated. Coding can be Uh, generative coding can be yeah. adaptive, responsive, adaptive coding can be all the things that like visually come out of code. Flexible visual systems. In yes, there, right? there you go. Mm. That's that second bucket. And then we say the assumption going into this advanced class is that you already know how to do the second bucket. Is that you know how to make design interactive and generative and all these these different things. Mm. The third bucket, which is the the difficult one is using those new possibilities in form and function, using those outputs, and channeling them into something that has greater meaning and impact. Nice. So that's where we talk about how brands today, they want to, brands and designs and organizations and communication design starts to need to represent the concept of diversity. And then we say, okay, well, how can you do diversity? Well, we have generative coding. So mm -hmm. with generative, maybe you start to channel that into something that looks like it represents diverse voices. Yeah. Um, or brands that want to show that they evolve over time. So then we say, okay, use an API, make it timed with some sort of data, and then you have something that evolves over time. It's relevant. We talk about design empathy and how you can use interactivity to sort of like literally use the user as part of the design and that creates empathy in the output of the design. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, and the list goes on. Um, there's, it's, it's an ever growing list and throughout the semester we sort of like build on that list of what are those new possibilities in meaning and impact that benefit from those possibilities in form and in function in that second, second uh, mm. bucket. And it's interesting. That's very interesting. I think I see a fourth uh, element there, uh, which is, Like, to be honest, for me, coding had nothing to do with just making design. Mm -hmm. um, it was more about, like, thinking about the world, mm -hmm. right? So creative coding or actually programming in general, like, enabled me to think, like, to explore new territories of thinking. And um, yeah. I started to think, like, through programming and, like, learning, like, ah, okay, this is how the things work like the very basic elements, I started to think way more critically about uh, digital structures. I was getting more into web development. I was yeah. able to build my own platform, like to liberate myself from mm -hmm. all the tools that we have out there, which are actually like uh, funneling the, the, um, the outcomes into a specific direction. So I, I just perceive learning to code as a very liberating thing. Mm -hmm. um, also yeah. something that just brought me into let's say philosophical spheres that I never like I never dreamt that this is existing like mm -hmm. I found this super interesting like to use all these explore all these new ways of yeah. looking at digital at software and yeah. stuff
Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's an infinite tool. Yeah, yeah. But it's not really related to design, so that's pre probably why it's kind of outside of the three bucket thing it, you mentioned. Does, uh, it, would you separate in, in this conversation, are you separating, I guess, create, creative outputs from the bucket term design? Uh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. So when you say it's not design, what is it? Well, that's a. It was stupid what I said. I think it doesn't make any sense anymore <laughs> to me. Like, I was just. <laughs> Thinking of that, stupid. and you know, it was a <laughs> it was stupid. Of Not course. necessarily. I think. Uh, well, let me think. Well, for me, I don't know. I, I don't know. What do you think? How do you, how does it how does it? What you so what you're describing to me? So, and this might be just a, a we're, we're getting to something. To me, that sounds like the second bucket. It sounds like mm. the new things you can do, like the the new outputs, the visual outputs, the things that you see that and. Uh, But for, but for you, it sounds like it's not just visual, right? It's, it's also structural and... Wait, well, I think I, I look at it a little bit more holistic. Like, I, um, for me personally, um, and of course you can have the same experience with different things as well, with sports, with reading, yeah. with whatever, you know? But I met amazing people, I made friendships, mm -hmm. I built a community, <laughs> I make my living now from teaching. Like, all these mm -hmm. things are, for me, like, in a retrospective, mm -hmm the reason why I code it even though I didn't know that these things are going to happen right I see so I look at it like a, I see I see it's, I see, like, I a, see. it's like a path it's something oh that, my God, yeah. that I follow and that I really enjoy and I love the people that um, yeah. for example when I studied communication design it's bachelor's later I made my master in media art but my uh, bachelor in um, communication design was very like everybody was like kind of hiding their ideas from the others, yeah. right? Like very protective and it was very isolated. But what I experienced when I came in touch with the programmers, I loved yeah. this mindset of sharing, yeah. of hacking, of yeah, thinking yeah, yeah, differently, yeah. like thinking about things as systems and, uh, you know, yeah. that's what totally. motivates me so much to teach. Yeah. yeah. And I think we're in a very, you and I are in a very special part of design history because, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm sure you relate to this, that they're the type of people who like to design and code or create with code, I guess we'll say, it, are, they have a certain way of thinking. They're the ones who love the creative outputs, but they also love the systematic thinking. And until, mm -hmm. until this year or until the last five, 10 years that this was a, a new way of designing, There wasn't really a role in mm. design or in the world for people who like to think that way. The, totally. the roots are like, okay, you could become an architect mm -hmm. or you could become an old, old school designer. Mm. Um, but there really wasn't that thing that like, I, I know personally when I was in high school, I loved math. And I love create. I love. Like, I saw your scribbles on your Instagram of your math I formulas. Yeah, yeah. that's so crazy. So <laughs> if you if you told high school me that I could that I would be using math on a daily basis, and also making really beautiful things, I would have died. I would have been like, how is that possible? <laughs> that's that's insane. I that's don't believe amazing. you. And it's it's because it didn't exist back then, and mm. now it's a thing, and oh. that's it's very exciting. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's that's amazing. I, I think what you're describing, it sounds like, maybe I'm romanticizing it, but um, you know about the whole, like, New York in the 1960s, like, Andy Warhol and, mm -hmm. like, all of, like that, like, creative energy and mm -hmm. also the fun. And, that's, like, that's, like, what we're doing, but, like, with code, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> right? That's amazing. Yeah. We were romanticizing it, but it's nice to think about. In a way, well, when I think back, when I started 20, I think I started creative coding with processing. I, of course, I did some things with technology before, but... Uh, 2014 uh, and I was working as a web developer for like after my studies and I had some friends who they had founded studios and um, from that moment that kind of top bottom relationship started with de designers mm -hmm. like as soon as I started to say like okay from now on I, I love WordPress I love working uh, on websites so because yeah. for me WordPress for example was a like a tool of liberation I know they are much cooler frameworks but mm -hmm. That was the technology I've learned. Yeah. Uh, all my, my website is built with it, yeah. and it liberated me not just in the way I work, but even like how I built my business. Yeah. It's based on WordPress. Yeah. So in that time, I started to build WordPress websites, and that motivated me as well. But as soon as I started to say, like, I love to be a web developer, people were like, okay, this is the guy in the basement. You know, we are <laughs> yeah. dreaming up the concepts yeah. Yeah. and we are going to oh. pitch it down yeah. to this, this guy and we are not going to discuss about uh, anything. 
And I was um, trapped in that role for many yeah. years. Like I was working for agencies, really cool projects, yeah. like amazing designers as well. Yeah. But nobody had a sense of how to bridge the gap between tech and design. Yeah. And I felt like an idiot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and that's still a thing. It's mm. very important for designers who are starting out right now, who want to code in their practice. It's very important for them to draw that line. I think um, it, it's good for getting new clients. It's good if you're just starting out to maybe develop a few projects so that you understand how those websites work and how backends work and things like that. That's important. Yeah. But it's very important to know when to draw the line to say, no, I'm not a developer and no, I'm not going to develop this website for you because I'm a designer who codes. And mm -hmm. there's a different difference there. That's a great, that's a great way of saying this. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. You are a designer who codes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, the, of course, like when you're in such a project architecture, let's say, like there's a design team and there's like a, people who say, we, I was also having a, like a, he was my colleague, he was making the back end. So it was very isolated. But um, Rune Madsen, he wrote an amazing essay on this. Mm -hmm. Did you read it? Uh, I think it's called something like, a, I don't know, like Design Systems International. Have you heard of them? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, he made the processing website and he's yeah. very, he's in Copenhagen. I met him there. So it's about bridging this gap. And I think, yeah, especially in the US, I see the paradigm shift happening. Mm -hmm. And here, maybe the university is adapting it, but still, the big agencies still have this very yeah. rigid, very inflexible uh, structures. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah. difficult. And again, I, th I think that just comes down to the systems that are and have been in place. And now it's time for designers like you and me to go in and shake it up and show them that it's a Boom. little different. Let's do it, Talia. Let's do it. That's amazing. Wow. That was a really nice motivational sentence. I love yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, that's cool. I see that there's, when I started to teach, like there was a so much requests like people yeah. were like I was getting so many requests for workshops and stuff so they are catching up yeah right? they are but the structures and the economy are still very rigid especially well at least here yeah. in Europe from my point of view yeah. it's still very top bottom it is it is it is and I, I, there is still that kind of like people are still d designers and, and agencies are still scared of code it's still the c word is still daunting the c word because yeah. um because it's it's not globally seen as a design medium it's mm. still kind of like this this mysterious why do people even do it and that's again returning back to the theme one more reason why it's so important to make sure that it, at least as a designer to make sure that the work that you make but it it resonates and it has a meaning behind it I love this uh, formulation. I'm a designer who codes. That's really powerful because that's creating a hierarchy. Sorry, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, yeah. Like I'm a designer first of all. That's right. But I code. That's right. That's amazing. That's like, right. I was thinking, to be honest, I was thinking about my about my Instagram bio mm. because the Instagram bio it so may difficult. it may sound very strange. Yeah. I loved yours, by the way. I checked yours. <laughs> You said something with a heart at the, at the end. Like oh, I'm just like, grateful for uh, everyone. Exactly. I that am. was nice. And uh, I think the Instagram bio is a space where you have to put everything into like one sentence. Yeah. Right? And yeah, I think maybe I, I, Designer who I copy that. Do it. Do it. <laughs> that, used to be, that used to be the opening line of all of my talks. And I was going to take it away for, for this talk, but maybe I'll throw that back in. Maybe that's the, the, the claim we have to push. Yeah. Right? Maybe that's absolutely. the that's the that's the claim we have to push. We are not developers, we are designers of code, mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, wow, what's your dream client? Oh, I don't know. Um, I, I I'm bad at answering that question. I like all the projects. It's I'm a on. very standard question, like yeah. you can uh, I, I didn't use ChatGPT for that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just came up. Dream client, I think. Um, a project, let's say. Okay, you wait. You have, let's say, fifty thousand euros, and you can do whatever you want with that. What project? Only fifty thousand. No, I'm joking. <laughs> let's say. Um, let's say one hundred. Anything I do with it, I um. Maybe it's a shame that I can't think big right now, but um, I, I I do think that in general I've always I've always just because I've done the agency life and I did Pentagram for so long I. I really do love the projects that have a wide audience that get a lot of spread. 
like a big brand rebranding and mm-hmm. in their rebrand doing something that is really original and really different using code. Mm-hmm. Um, and no, I'm not just saying like building a generator and like their design team may or may not use it for the assets that come out. Um, so, so I think um, size wise, that would be my dream. Um, but I think it, it's, it, it, it will be very important what that, um, what the mission is behind that or that company. So mission technology, I'd say like if, if open AI wanted to rebrand again, they shouldn't because it's an amazing brand, but if they wanted to, that's a company that they have a very strong mission and they're rooted in technology. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like a good target for, well, how do we use the technology to kind of like tell that's the story of the brand and tell that mission using design principles. I got it. Um, oh, I'm super critical about that, to be honest. I am very, I don't know, I'm pretty you're not annoyed of that. Yeah, you're I think, not alone. Uh, it's like a, I don't know. For me, like this AI thing, especially in Europe, again, yeah. like it's a different, it's a different, maybe a different discussion. But for me in Europe, it's like we are getting even more dependent on American tech, right? Yeah. And uh, That's very like putting everything on a very fragile system, mm-hmm. right? So um, and also, I don't know. Wait, let's not not go into that let's discussion. Not go, okay. But I felt like, yeah, I, this is for me like a. But talking AI, how do you use AI in the world? Do you? Um, very, very little. A lot, but very little. Um, I think we, 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 AI has been uh, publicly used for about a year now, a little over a year now. And I think we can all admit that there have been moments in using AI in the last year where we have been so frustrated by the output, whether it is a written output or a visual output or a coded output. And we're like, no, AI, like you just don't get it. Um, and obviously it's going to continue to get better but i think we're at least right now we're in in this place where if you are coding and if you coding to design and if you are using the chat gpt or another ai to help you along with your code Mm -hmm. you're going to figure out very quickly if your concept is an original idea or a good idea if open ai can't help you and typically with the work that we do we find that like four prompts in it totally gets it wrong. And then it cannot figure out what we're trying to do. And yeah, that's yeah. when you're like, yes, like it's a good idea. Let's keep doing it. And let's, and you have to figure it out yourself at the end of the day. So it helps get from um, zero to 10, mm-hmm. but the 10 to 100, it's still the work that we have to do. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, for me, mm, I use ChatGPT um, for like to writing backend code, especially. Mm, like, that's yes. super powerful. Yeah, 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 yeah Super yeah, yeah, yeah. powerful. Like, for example, things that I had to research yes. before. Yeah. Like, you make a prompt and you just tell it, okay, and I didn't need a, I don't know, a, a node, a data node for, yeah. my, for my WordPress website. Yeah. Boom, Great. there it is. Yeah, that's or helpful. Or making small JavaScript uh, features for yeah. the front end or stuff. Like very basic really, stuff. Really, really very good. helpful, yeah. Works incredibly. Like, yeah. Super, super good. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. And then it allows you to focus on the stuff that it can't do just a little bit more. Mm. What do you think, like, students seem to perceive the decision to learn to code like something like a, like a big one, right? It's mm-hmm. like for them like an on, and on or off, mm-hmm. a yes or no, mm-hmm. a white or black. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons why they don't take, take, take on it. Mm-hmm. That's my um, impression sometimes. Mm-hmm. At the moment, for me, this whole AI hype um, is kind of a noise signal. Mm-hmm. Like I am, I was always like pushing out the message. I'm totally convinced that it is very valuable and 100% worth the time to learn to code. Mm-hmm. But AI seems to be something like a noise signal that people seem to be very hesitant and very doubtful about it. So, what do you think? How um, does? Or let me put the question differently. Uh, do you think um, a decision for or against learning to code is influenced by AI in the l- last years? Would you say that changed your perspective on that? In my experience, it hasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's still an innate thing. If somebody falls in love with code the first time they're taught it, um, they'll. I think they'll choose to do it with or without AI. Mm-hmm. Um, and even more so, I think that the students who fall in love with code, they fall in love for it not because of the output. They fall in love with it because they love the process of it. Yeah. That almost goes back to your your community, the people that we love. Yeah, that, that exactly. Does, it, we, we love the output, but we love the process. That's true. That's true. That's, yeah. And that's, that's, that's tip, what I've seen is what makes a student want to pursue something. Mm. 
Got it. Yeah. That's what I always push for. Yeah. Like, enjoy the process. Yeah. That's exactly, amazing. Exactly. And you know what? You know, when you start to learn to um, like pursue a goal that mm -hmm. you want to achieve and it's difficult mm -hmm. and you're facing obstacles and problems and you have to ask people about that, that's the real value. Yeah. Because you learn to get, you know, you get confronted with this yeah. fear of maybe, yeah. you know, failing or stuff. Yeah. But overcoming that, I think this is maybe yeah. one of the most precious and valuable things you have yeah. in the process of learning to code, right? For the, yeah. So it's a model for the world. It's a model for the things that we confronted yeah. with every day. Like it's a, It's a, it's a test laboratory for difficult situations. I love it so much. Yeah. My students hate it when I say, they, they usually my first year students come to me and they say, hey, is it possible to do such and such? And my answer is, everything is possible. That's nice. <laughs> um, it just depends how much work you want to put into it, how many people you want to ask, how deep you want to go into the line of code, but everything really is possible. Mm -hmm. And they hate that, um, but it really is true. But what I say on, I, I, they hear that all throughout the semester and then they, they hate me for saying it, but then they realize it for themselves throughout the semester. And then on the last day, we channeled that into, well, now that you've been coding for a full semester, you sort of start to get in this mindset of yeah. everything is possible. True. And I know that for me personally, when I was learning how to code, I was also, I was going through some health stuff and yeah, and it, it really affects the way you see the world is, is that everything is possible in coding and life and mm. the design world and everything. And it's just, it's an optimistic way of thinking, I think. Absolutely, I love that, yeah, true. And the thing is like, Uh, it's it's literally everything is possible because code can be used to create anything, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's not like again we are getting back to the design tool funnels. Like you know, Adobe tells you how to design something, right? By 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 uh, putting a user interface out there, but with code you can make anything. Yeah. So this, I love that. That's right. That's cool. Uh, I had one more thing I wanted to ask you. Let me think. Again. Was it the same question? Did you remember the good question from before? No, unfortunately not. Unfortunately, you'll not. text me after. But uh, maybe you can send me a, a voice message later. When Sounds good. We'll do. <laughs> That's nice for the collage for the video as well. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah, we already have quite some minutes together, but yeah. there was one more thing I wanted to ask you. No problem. Ah, this. Um, I think. I just want to ask you, because I've been uh, checking out a lot of these net art scene and so on, what kind of role does that play for you? Like, is it interesting? Did you, do you, do you, have you been dealing with that or like the, the past of the internet, like how the yeah. early net artists were doing work and Oli Ali Alina and yeah. um, these people, Rezone.org, this kind of community? Very familiar with that, cool. um, with that group, um, way of thinking, philosophy. Um, but for me, in my process and career, there was kind of a very distinct turning point of, I think a lot of people were going in that direction. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I, I consciously made the decision to start working in the agency world because I knew that that's, that's really what I personally liked to work on. Mm -hmm. um, something a little bit more applied, something that has a larger audience Got perhaps. Um, and in the agency world, nobody was coding. And I think that's sort of like maybe, maybe one of the reasons why my work looks the way it does. That's your right? niche. That's yeah. your blue ocean. Yeah. Here, right? But it's interesting. We're actually working with, um, with a sister of Rhizome right now. We're doing a brand for mm -hmm. something similar. And it's, it's the perfect project because Gosh, it amazing. is the whole like net art aesthetic and philosophy but it is a brand and it is a website and it needs to have the same communication design principles that I'm familiar with. So it's like... It sounds like a perfect project. It's so exciting. We like, love it. It's so much fun. Like that sound also for me, like, you know, many hearts yeah. popping up here, yeah. invisible. Amazing. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. We're so excited about it. That's super, super cool. Also, I, I've been checking out like the, the recent scene. I discovered Laurel Schwartz. Yeah. You know her? Uh, th yeah, through a hundred different overlaps. I never actually met my her. My goodness, her though. essay on... Yeah. Uh, did you read that? Like, my website is a floating mm -hmm. boat. So kind of, She's fantastic. It's beautiful. Yeah. I want everybody to read that essay, okay? Yeah. So it's an amazing essay on what a website can be. Yeah. And it's poetic. Yeah. It's actually, uh, I'm, I'm writing essays right now. Great. Like I'm into... So good. I'm, this is my... I wish I had time for that. I want to write. <laughs> actually, the cool thing is, like, my community is super super nice now it's working very well like people are helping each other on the discord server of course it's still a lot of work for yeah. me but i also have some time to kind of 
uh, let's say, um, have a more altitude and mm -hmm. look from it from above. Yeah. And also create projects that uh, don't just deal with, the, let's say, execution of and maintenance of the of the community because it yeah. works. It's amazing. Yeah. I have the time to read about philosophy which is very interesting for me like my favorite topic right now like I started with the ancient times and now I go more into the present and it's beautiful that's great and now I'm uh, created this blog called downgrade which is uh, yeah about yeah, downgrading great downgrading whatever yeah. you you know it's I have two posts up I would love to hear your, yeah. your uh, opinion about that God, I'd love to read that that's um, great also have you heard of digital gardening That's something I did also. Mm -hmm. like a, no. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> okay, I tell you about digital gardening. Digital gardening means that you mm, create, uh, have you heard of Obsidian? Or like these tools that you use to sort your, your notes and thoughts. It's called the second brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you write a lot of stuff and try to like create a body of very different notes and then you merge them together into texts. So that's uh, actually digital gardening. Cool. I wrote a, I wrote a um, text on how great. I do that. And yeah. I'll read it. That sounds great. Yeah. I'm, it's a little bit off track what I'm telling you now. I <laughs> no, could tell it's, you it's not, what I cooked not. yesterday. Is yeah. also, <laughs> it's but, all connected. It's all connected. It's a, I, I, I did that as a website first. Yeah. And I, I like, it, like an intranet for my own yeah. thoughts, like my own little Twitter, maybe. Mm -hmm. What's in my mind? So it's really cool. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I, th I think it's important for designers specifically to branch out of design yeah. a lot. Epstein, this is this guy who wrote this book about generalists. He said, like, you always have to put one feet out of your comfort zone. I love that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and specifically in design because very little design is about design. Most design that you see is about. Uh, any other field, any other industry. It's, it's about education. It's about a startup. It's about uh, anything else. So you have to really know nonprofits, political, whatever it is, education. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's about knowing a little bit of everything and sure. also knowing the design principles to make it possible. So it, I, yeah, keep it coming. That's that's great. That was a really nice wrapping up for this video. I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Talia. It's Thank amazing. you so much, Tim. It was so much fun. I wish that you enjoy Barcelona a lot. It's an amazing city. It is. I will it's watch so your great. talk great. from the outside of the off. Great. And uh, yeah, amazing. let me know when you're around next time. Will do. Thanks so much, cool. Tim. Cool. Thank you. And bye bye, guys. Bye, See everyone. you soon. Bye. Wow, that was an amazing interview. I'm so thankful, grateful that I had the opportunity to talk to Talia. It was really inspiring. Uh, yeah. I hope you liked it. Um, let me know what you think about it in the comments. And yeah, see you soon and enjoy the next video you will watch on YouTube. Whatever it is, maybe one of my tutorials. I've got a channel with many, hopefully great, <laughs> processing creative coding P5.js tutorials. Uh, enjoy and see you soon. Bye bye. Peace out.